No doubt you are asking everyone else about the significance of their hat. I love it that Jimmy kind of waded into a minefield there on the hat tradition. As the new guy, I'm usually the one making those kinds of faux pas, so I'm so glad he did that. Um, I guess I owe you something about, I really uh, made a really uninspired choice of my hat. This is, used to be my golf hat. I stopped playing golf, playing more pickleball, and that's the hat I play pickleball in. Um, and so really it's just sort of uh, uh, Dave Jeter is, is giving me, you know, is uh, voting against my hat. It, it's really a silent protest against the fact that I've got some family obligations today and I won't be able to play pickleball. Uh, I mean, I'm not petty, I just wanted you to know. <laughs> and a little more on that here in just a minute. Okay. Many of us have complicated relationships to the different traditions that shape our lives, and Mother's Day today is no exception. I don't know if your family has specific traditions for this day. Our family really doesn't. Case in point, today we will be driving to Lawrence to pack up Oliver's dorm room, clean out that gross dorm room, then bring all that stuff that we don't have room for back to our place. So really looking forward to it. It's gonna be a special day. <laughs> But we've had worse Mother's Days. When we lived in New York City, I served a small new worshiping community that met at Union Theological Seminary. This is in Morningside Heights, so just north of the Upper West Side. Because it was a new community, we had to set up and tear down our worship space every week. So it always took me an extra long time uh, to get away after Sunday morning worship. One Mother's Day, I asked Stephanie where she wanted to go for brunch that day, and she picked a French place uh, nearby. And I was later than usual getting away that day, so um, there was a long wait for a table after that. The boys were complaining that they were about to starve. We finally uh, got a table and ordered our food, and I tried to salvage the day at this point. The things were not going in a good direction. I tried to salvage it by saying to the boys, while we're waiting for our food, let's all name what we love best about mom. And Oliver, who was seven at the time, said, how about we do best and worst? <laughs> I distinctly remember walking to the subway and Stephanie saying to me, I think this is the worst Mother's Day I have ever had. So our scripture reading today is going to be about the promise of lively, life-giving traditions. But before we read that from 1 Corinthians 15, I want to tell you a little story about the coelacanth, and it will get us there. So on the screen... You'll see a fossil of a coelacanth fish. You've probably seen this before. We've always known that coelacanths once existed. We have fossils of coelacanths from as far back as 360 million years ago, and then we have some fossils of them from as recently as 80 million years ago. But it's long been assumed that coelacanths went extinct approximately 65 million years ago um, during the great extinction in which all the dinosaurs disappeared. And then, in 1938, a coelacanth was caught off the east coast of South Africa. And many scientists consider this the greatest zoological discovery of the 20th century. So for many years after that find, in 1938, living coelacanths were known only from that one place, off between South Africa and Madagascar. But in, then in 1997, again in 1998, coelacanths were caught in Indonesia, nearly 6,000 miles to the east. So now that we know, now we know that coelacanths exist and that they exist in two distinct populations. Now these are massive uh, fish. There's a couple of pictures for you. They grow to about six feet in length. They weigh about 200 pounds. They have a lifespan of 60 years. So why did we assume that there were only ancient fossilized coelacanths but no living ones? Well, because these elusive deep sea creatures live a long way beneath the ocean surface, about five to 800 feet beneath the sea level. They've been found in depths up to 2,300 feet below the surface. And before the 20th century, of course, fishing at these depths was impossible. Early dives were too shallow. Descending to those depths were, was too uh, difficult. Early submersibles didn't get that deep either, so couldn't find these fish. They hide in deep caves during the day. They emerge at night to feed, but rather than ascending towards the surface, they actually go down deeper uh, to feed. You won't ever see a coelacanth in an aquarium. No one has ever figured out how to haul one to the surface and keep it alive. Now, I continue to find the story of the coelacanth helpful for living with traditions that shape our lives. 
It reminds me that what's old sticks around. The ancient endures. Down in the depths of your own life and experience, down in the depths of our own experience, our own history as a people, there is something pulsing and alive. We have a name for it. We call it tradition. So come with me and listen for God's voice to you from today's reading from 1 Corinthians 15. Brothers and sisters, I want to call your attention to the good news that I preached to you, which you also received and in which you stand. You're being saved through it if you hold on to the message I preached to you, unless somehow you believed it for nothing. I passed on to you, there's the word tradition, I traditioned to you as most important what I also received. Christ died for our sins in line with the scriptures. He was buried and he rose on the third day in line with the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at once. Most of them are still alive to this day, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as if I were born at the wrong time. I'm the least important of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I harassed God's church. I am what I am by God's grace. It's a great line. You can take it with you today. I am what I am by God's grace, and God's grace hasn't been for nothing. In fact, I worked harder than all the others. That is, it wasn't me, but the grace of God that's with me. So then, whether you heard the message from me or them, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. This is the word of the Lord. So you're here and I'm here. You're either in the sanctuary or you're online participating in worship today. And lots of the things that we're doing this morning have been done for a long time, even if we try to put our own spin on them. So I wonder, do you consider this congregation, this church, traditional? Do you think of yourself as a traditional person for participating in such ancient rituals? Maybe some of you have an aversion to these words, tradition and traditional. I want to invite you to reflect on your relationship to a, a long tradition of faith this morning. I want you to puzzle with me for a bit about why we're here doing this rather traditional thing when tradition, I think we'd, most of us would admit, as a word, elicits considerable skepticism in our wider culture. I don't think all traditions are good, of course. Some of them are stupid, silly, and harmful. I don't have time for that list. Uh, I bet you have your own list. But for me, being situated, embedded in a faith tradition can be wonderful, progressive, energizing, fresh, adaptive, and innovative. And what I wanna say this morning in reading this text is that this particular tradition about the living Christ is a lively one. We might be an old church, historically speaking. There are older ones, of course, but this congregation, Second, has been around for a while. We might be an old church, but we're doing new things. We're not interested in becoming a perfect imitation of a first century church. We're after a vibrant, meaningful way of life that connects us to the living Christ here in our midst. The questions we're asking are about what the good news looks like for ordinary people like us here in the 21st century. We can't simply keep repeating all the answers that worked for generations before us. We're looking for fresh expressions of faith for our time and for our place. In today's reading, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we have the good news about God's love because it has been traditioned down to us. This is verse 3. He writes, I passed on to you as most important what I also received. This language about passing on or passing along, this is the language for tradition. I traditioned it to you. Now, in the ancient world, in the Apostle Paul's world, tradition was a positive word. To live within a tradition, that was always a good thing. Not always so for us in our world, where change and discovery and innovation are just part of the air that we all breathe. Tradition might worry some of us, and rightly so. For many of us, the word tradition has a bad reputation. Maybe it has harmed or oppressed you or someone you love. Sometimes tradition represents what's past, what's old, what's stale, dead, lifeless. So it might be difficult for us to hear that living with tradition is at the very heart of a healthy way of life. 
to hear that living with tradition is the very heart of being a church that gathers around the good news of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. So just for a quick moment, what is it that Paul claims has been passed on, passed along, or traditioned to us? Well, verse 3 through 5. I passed on to you, I traditioned to you, as most important what I also received. Christ died for our sins in line with the scriptures. He was buried and he rose on the third day in line with the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, that's just Aramaic for Peter. So he appeared to Peter and then to the 12 apostles. This early Christian summary of the faith is short. According to Paul, the most important and perhaps maybe the only interesting thing the church has to say is that the Christ who died and was buried was raised on the third day and is now among us as the living Christ. So for us, the tradition concerns a contemporary liveliness. Being rooted in a tradition basically functions as a call for us to wake into the sacred importance of what's going on right here and right now. God's love, God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's power. These aren't realities confined to some distant past. This old story continues to be the newness that sh shapes our lives and opens fresh possibilities for us and for others. When we read the words of the Apostle Paul writing about a tradition that is of first importance, you are already witnessing an early Christian effort to make sense of an old tradition in a new way. The Christians in Corinth were far enough removed from actual, the actual life of Jesus that they themselves needed to receive the tradition and to make creative use of it in their own day. And one of the unique things about being Presbyterian is that we take seriously the call to keep listening for the new things God's Spirit calls us to be and to do in our time and place. We have a slogan for this that goes back several centuries, Semper Reformanda, reformed and always reforming. That's a confession by Presbyterians that the work of reforming, of changing, of adapting, of innovating, that's just part of what faithfulness to this living Christ looks like. Many of our more conservative friends read the Bible as a book with all the final answers about life. For those that swim in these particular Christian traditions, the Bible is the end, the final word in any conversation. Not so for us as Presbyterians. For us, the Bible is a record of the witness of the earliest Christians to the living reality of Jesus Christ. For us, the Bible is the beginning of a fascinating, interesting conversation. So we welcome the ancient tradition, but we take responsibility for the creativity that faithfulness requires. Church historian Yaroslav Pelikan puts it this way, and this will be on the screen. I like this distinction he makes. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Tradition lives in conversation with the past while remembering where we are and when we are and that it is we who have to decide. Traditionalism, on the other hand, supposes that nothing should ever be done for the first time, so that all that's needed to solve any problem is to arrive at the supposedly unanimous testimony of the homogenized tradition. So friends, the Christian tradition is not a set of doctrines or beliefs that just stays the same all the time. Instead, the Christian tradition is nothing other than a posture of paying attention to the living Christ here in our midst. That's why Paul recounts all those to whom the risen Christ appeared. The risen Christ appeared to ordinary people who had bet their lives that God's way is the way of hope, that the hard work of forgiveness is better than anger and revenge, that care for the poor and for the sick is what makes our lives purposeful, meaningful. But don't miss this, Christ is as alive and as real for us as he was for those early followers. We too have our own experience of the living Christ. You may have felt this risen Christ as a new energy or a pulsing aliveness. This Christ might appear to you as a buzzing life-shaping life reality in with and under, underneath your ordinary rhythms. Christ might appear to you in disguise simply as the resilience and the determination to keep going, keep loving, and to stay open when life is hard. Christ may appear in the softening of your hatred or as a growing ability to love those who are really, really annoying and difficult to love. Christ can appear to us in a challenging call into a life of service and compassion or even as the peaceful warmth that washes over us in times of great distress, sadness, or pain. 
Christ can come to us in the affectionate touch of another. And for some, Christ can take the shape of even scientific wonder or ravishing beauty. Some of us here at Second, I think it's safe to say, are finding that the living Christ is most real, most clearly present to us in our social justice efforts. The risen Christ can appear to you in these ways and lots of other ones. By the grace of God, I am what I am, says Paul, and, the gra- and God's grace to me was not without effect. God's grace comes to us in the risen Christ and flips a switch, turns us on, brings us to life, energizes us for the work of love and friendship and care and forgiveness. We keep innovating together because faithfulness to this living Christ requires it. The very establishment of reformed congregations like ours in the 16th century was itself an innovation within a longer tradition. So was the full inclusion of women in the life and leadership of the church this past century. So was the full inclusion and blessing of same-sex couples and LGBTQ persons. So was the mobilization of the church's energy to address racial injustice and economic inequality. And the living Christ will continue to lead us out into new territory as we follow. I want to conclude this morning with an actual story from the New York Times that I found hilarious this week. I'm quoting, Laura Young was browsing through a Goodwill store in Austin, Texas in 2018 when she found a bust for sale. It was resting on the floor under a table and had a yellow price tag slapped on its cheek, $34.99. She bought it. After taking the bust home, strapped in a seatbelt in the front seat of her car, she contacted two auction houses, Bonhams and Sotheby's, both of which confirmed that her hunch was right. The bust was from ancient Rome. It was an actual Roman bust from the late first century BC or early first century AD, which had been part of a Bavarian king's art collection from the 19th century until it was looted and somehow brought to the United States after World War II. I love this scene. Laura Young is wandering through Goodwill. Who knows what, you know, she's looking for martini glasses or something. She finds an ancient Roman bust priced at $34.99. I love it that in this picture you can literally see the yellow price tag on the face of this bust. Friends, sometimes life is like that. You're muddling through when all of a sudden you experience something old and profound, something ancient and enduring, and it's available. You can have it. You can get it. You can buy an ancient Roman bust for $34.99. <laughs> what I mean, of course, is that you too can live a life of, in deep connection to an ancient but lively tradition. Second, Presbyterian is a place for people who want a mixture of rootedness and exploration, who want to be both ancient and modern. This is a community for people who want something with roots, with depth, with a way of life anchored in something large and beautiful and holy and ancient. And yet, we want this faith to be new. We want something fresh, alive, energizing, vibrant, and real. We want a faith that directs us to the future. So, may God help us pay attention to the living Christ here among us. Amen.